Yeah, that's me, a Mexican free-tailed bat blown up an Air Force base. You're probably wondering how I got here. It all started in the summer of 1941. You can see me in the back corner here, photobombing the family vacation picture from Lytle S. Adams, a dental surgeon from Pennsylvania. Honey, that right there is the lowest form of life. Then why did God create them, Father? The Lord works in mysterious ways. This was Pearl Harbor. My God! It was at this moment that I realized bats had been created to await this hour, to play their part in the scheme of free human existence, to frustrate any attempts of those who dare desecrate our way of life. XOXOXO Lytle Adams. P.S. Tell Eleanor hi from me. Eleanor, your weird dentist friend is sending me letters about blowing up Japan with bats. Inexplicably, President Roosevelt okayed this project, granting Adams millions of dollars to research how to use bats to set things on fire. The Air Force took responsibility for this research since bats, like airplanes, fly. FDR assured everyone, this man is not a nut, which is a bold thing to say about any dentist. However, also approving Adams' batty scheme was Donald Griffin, a researcher who conducted groundbreaking work on bats' echolocation abilities, and one of the very first scientists who ever argued that non-human animals possessed consciousness. Indeed, no one on the team that Adams assembled thought to question the morality or ecological consequences of sacrificing a few million bats. Not even the mammologist and self-described bat lover Jack Von Blocher. Not anyone else on the team, either, including actor Tim Holt who appeared in about 46 Western movies in the 40s and 50s, and not even the former gangster. The National Park Service, for whatever reason, went along with this plan, letting Adams' ragtag team harvest thousands of bats for testing out the plan. But what exactly was the plan? Well, it's simple. Adams knew a few things. He knew that, for one, most of the buildings in 1940s Japan were made out of wood and paper. Two, that bats roosted before dawn. Three, that you should floss every day. And four, that bats were pretty strong. Knowing all of this, he concocted a scheme. If you released a bunch of bats at night, they would roost in the eaves of buildings before dawn in a 30 to 40 mile radius, roughly how far they fly in a single night. And then if you strapped a bunch of incendiaries to these bats, you could time them to all go off at dawn, causing fires that would ravage through Japanese cities. Tubes would be glued onto the front of the bats. Originally, they were filled with white phosphorus, but then Louis Pfizer joined the team, the Harvard researcher who pioneered the synthesis of vitamin K and also military effective napalm. So, then they were filled with napalm. Although each bat would carry only a tiny amount of napalm, about half an ounce, it was estimated that one single bat bomb would cause over a thousand times the number of fires of traditional incendiaries. One bat bomb would hold over a thousand napalm-laden bats. The bats would be induced into hibernation before being loaded up into the bomb by being cooled in ice trays. Then, when loaded up, the bat bomb would be dropped like any other bomb at around 4,000 feet high, and then a parachute would open to soften the fall. And while the bomb casing was falling, compartments would open up to unleash all of the bats. However, the way that the bat bomb would release all of these bats proved difficult. It was hard to get all the bats to exit, or else exit at the right time. Some simply dropped to the ground like rocks because they were either over-encumbered by the napalm, or because they never woke up from their hibernation. Some got out too early, or even escaped while being loaded up, and would then blow up testing sites. One even blew up a general's car. Different military divisions played hot potato with the Bat Bomb project until it was eventually cancelled in 1944. While the Bat Bomb may have technically been more effective than typical incendiaries, they just couldn't hold a candle to nukes. And so funding and research energy for the Bat Bomb project were all redirected to the Manhattan Project. Adams, however, lived on to propose many more crazy schemes in the future, like bombing prairies with seed packets and vending machines that distributed fried chicken. But actually, using little flying animals to deliver incendiaries is not historically unprecedented. Olga of Kiev was the queen regent of Kievan Rus, or what was basically medieval Russia between 945 and 960, and she devised a bat bomb of her own. But before I can tell you how or why she used it, I think her whole story deserves some telling. It might only be tangentially related animals and animal facts, but it's sick as hell, so bear with me. In 945, Olga's husband, King Igor, was slaughtered by a group of rebels called the Drevlians. No, they weren't a race of aliens, but medieval Gopniks. With her husband dead and the heir to the throne, only a three-year-old boy, Olga took over temporary control of the throne as her son's regent. And with the throne being hers, she made it her mission to avenge the murder of her husband. 
The Drevlian ambassadors who told Olga about the death of her husband were the first to be on the chopping block. Not only did the messengers tell her that her husband had been killed by Prince Maul, but they also told her that Prince Maul would be more than happy to have her hand in marriage now that she was single. This proposal was, of course, offered as an insult. But Olga took the term don't shoot the messenger to heart. So instead, she lured the ambassadors back to her courtroom, and then she shoved them all into trenches in which she buried them all alive. So, not only did Olga inspire the Bat Bomb, but she also pioneered the use of trench warfare. Olga then sent her own messengers over to the Drevlians who were unaware that their ambassadors had been slaughtered. She told the Drevlians to send over their finest men so they could honor the life of her husband together. Inexplicably, the Drevlians sent over a second crew of diplomats. And when they arrived, Olga told them that they should take a nice hot bath after their long journey. Emphasis on the hot. Because the vengeful regent then locked the bathhouse and set it on fire. The Trevlians were still somehow unaware that not one, but two squadrons of their diplomats had been massacred by Olga. They further accepted the grieving widow's request to hold a feast in the city that her husband was slaughtered in, so that she could cry over his tomb. Olga celebrated and drank with the Drevlian diplomats and soldiers until they were all sloshed, and then had her men slaughter all of them. As you do. The few survivors of this feast fled the city, and then Olga laid siege to it for over a year. She was starting to get impatient. So she told the besieged people, Why are you guys holding out? It's not like I'm going to impose a giant fine on you if you surrender. The starved and tired Drevlians leapt at the opportunity to settle the matter amicably. Or, you know, as amicably as possible after being at war with someone for a year. Olga asked them to give her, as a tribute, just a few pigeons per household, and then she would leave them all be. But once she got these pigeons, she ordered her troops to tie little sulfur bombs to the birds and light them. The pigeons were all released to return to their roosts, and since they had sulfur bombs attached to them, the entire city burnt down to the ground. And as the people of the city fled, Olga ordered her soldiers to slaughter them or else take them as captives. Needless to say, after all of these atrocities, Olga was canonized as a saint by the Eastern Orthodox Church. Time will only tell if dental surgeon and father of the Bat Bomb, Lytle Adams, will receive the same treatment. You know what rhymes with Bat Bomb? Rat Bomb! Rat Bombs were not invented by a dentist, but instead by the British Special Operations Executive, or SOE, for use during a certain war that was going on during the 1940s. The British didn't strap little bombs to rats that would then scuttle around German bases, but instead, the British knew that the protocol for disposing of dead vermin was to set them on fire in the boiler room to mitigate the spread of disease. So, the British figured that if they stuck a bit of explosives into dead rats and then sprinkled these carcasses around German bases, then during their disposal, there was a non-zero chance that a boiler explosion could be triggered. The first shipment of explosive-laced dead rats was intercepted by the Germans. And so, they ended up expending a lot of resources throughout the war to inspect dead vermin for booby traps. So, the Germans' time was wasted, prodding around dead rat bodies no less, and so, the SOE considered this operation a tremendous success. Hi, I'm Dr. Adams, and I'm here to take your teeth. What's that? No, there's nothing to be worried about. So, how's your day been going? Fine. That's unfortunate. So have you heard about the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle deal? The what? I know a lot of my schemes sound crazy, but this one is great. You get two incredible educational streaming services for less than $15 for an entire year. <laughs> On Nebula, you get incredible, exclusive documentaries by all of your favorite smart indie creators like Real Life Lore. You can watch his entire Modern Conflict series, which has like eight videos that are too spicy for YouTube to handle. Firework? Yeah, and all Bioark videos come out early and ad-free. Okay, this is gonna hurt. Oh, and you also get access to thousands of fun and educational videos on Curiosity Stream, like the Flying Foxes of Australia, all about the biggest bats in the world. And all this for less than $15 a year. Click the link on screen now to sign up. So anyway, have you heard about NFTs? We got a little while, so I might as well explain. <laughs>